Uh, all right, so uh, my name is Max Tiger, and this is an introduction to Kryptonite. So just some background on me. I'm the CTO at Mercury. Uh, we are a banking startup here in San Francisco. We're you know, uh, actually two blocks away, actually. So we're hiring if you're interested in doing some Haskell work. So I'm to start with some caveats to this talk. First of all, I'm not a cryptographer. I'm not even an expert on Kryptonite. Uh, so I have less ambitious goals for this talk. The goals are to make sure that people are comfortable using Kryptonite, uh, that you're confident in Haskell's cryptographic abilities, like you wouldn't hesitate to, say, start a company with Haskell and wonder, is it going to have the tools I need to do two-factor authentication, for example? Uh, and also that if you're doing your own project, your own library, that you reach for Kryptonite instead of, uh, say, one of the other one-off packages out there to do some sort of cryptographic uh, feature. Uh, and for the structure of the talk, I'm going to first talk about like what is kryptonite. Then I'm going to talk about some of the fundamentals of kryptonite. I'm going to look at individual type signatures from the package, and then we'll look at we'll pull off pieces of those to investigate. Uh, then I'm going to use probably the remaining time for demos, and I don't think we have any time for the sidebar topics, which were just interesting side uh, topics to explore if we wanted to. So first, what is kryptonite? Uh, well, Kryptonite is your one-stop shop for Haskell cryptography, and I really mean it. They have 18 ciphers, five key derivation functions, which you'd use for passwords, three message authentication code functions, or MACs, which you'd use to make sure that a message hasn't been tampered with, 38 hashes. They have public key cryptography. They have random number generation, mathematical primitives, like generating primes within a certain range, et cetera. So really, you can get pretty much everything you need, bar a couple of things, just using Kryptonite, which is quite nice. Uh, the reason I think it's nice is that Kryptonite can really replace a lot of the existing packages that people have been using in sort of uh, a one-off manner. So for example, nonce, which is used to generate uh, one-time values used for a cryptographic uh, purpose, uh, OTP, which is used for two-factor authentication, decrypt for hashing passwords, and password store fast for storing passwords. So for example, password store fast hasn't been updated in like four years. I'm not sure it's being maintained. I'm pretty sure that the source code has been copied into the Usode project into like a utils password place, uh, which is good, but I'm not super confident that it's actually being maintained by anyone or that if there was some sort of issue with the algorithm that someone is actually looking at that code and caring about it. So that can be a little disconcerting or uneasy for cryptography. Uh, other uh, modules or libraries like OTP were just merged into Kryptonite. Uh, and then finally, you'll want maybe a more unified interface for cryptography if you're working on a larger product. So, you know, you need to hash passwords, you need password reset codes, two-factor authentication, maybe encryption for another feature. It'd be nice if all of this kind of came from the same place and used similar abstractions so you didn't have to learn a new thing every time that didn't quite fit with the other pieces. So that's sort of my pitch for why you might want to use Kryptonite uh, for your own use. So here's our first type signature that we're going to use to, uh, as a lens to sort of invest in a Kryptonite. This is for Argon2, which is a password hashing function. Uh, it won the password hashing competition, I think, in 2015. Uh, and what I want you to look at on this one is just the top part, just byte array access and byte array. So you can see that password and salt are instances of byte array access, and alt, what this hash function is returning, is an instance of byte array. So let's explore what those are. Well, they're not actually from the Kryptonite package. They're actually from the memory package, which Kryptonite uh, uses pretty extensively. So the memory package provides, as you might have guessed from the name, low-level memory functions, for example, if you want to get the first byte from an array of bytes or convert between encodings for, uh, for some binary data, it can do those things for you. And it's also type class based. So instead of your library taking, say, just a byte string, you can take a byte string or a new type of byte string or custom data that implements the functions that memory needs in order to get the data out uh, at like a byte level. So that first type class that we saw is byte array access, and this is the type class that memory provides. It provides read access to an array of bytes. So if you wanted to, say, get, uh, use the index function, you pass in an integer, and you get out the byte at that position from the array. And pretty simple. You'll see these exact same functions using something like byte string. This is just a type class version. 
or for example, const eek uh, does a constant time equality between two byte array accesses. So that means that uh, it will never shortcut. It will always use uh, an equal amount of time when comparing two things, uh, which helps prevent it from being uh, abused by attackers. There's also byte array, uh, which allows creating an array of bytes. So the byte array access allowed you to pull the data out of the byte string, but you couldn't actually create a new byte string with it, for example. But with byte array, you can. So you can use functions like append that takes two byte arrays and combines them together, uh, or convert, which takes something that is an instance of byte array access, like say a string, and turns it into a byte array, which, uh, sorry, use, turns it into a byte array, for example, a byte string. So the instances of these uh, that you'll mostly see are string, byte string, bytes, and scrub bytes. String and byte string you're familiar with. Uh, bytes and scrub bytes are from the memory package itself. Uh, I don't think I'll have time to go in too much detail, but bytes basically is a byte string with a little bit of data removed out of it. So because it does not track um, certain information about the data, I believe uh, like the offset of its slice, you can't actually slice from it and keep the same byte string as before, uh, which means that it's less efficient in that way, but it also stores less data, um, which means that if you need a lot of them or generating many of them, then it's a little faster. In practice, I would probably not use it because it seems like in my benchmarks that byte string is roughly just as fast and that'll interoperate better with the rest of the world. Uh, scrub bytes is pretty interesting. It's the same as bytes, but adds a couple of changes that you might be interested in doing for your own cryptographic code. Uh, for example, its eek instance is uh, constant time. Its show instance removes data from it. So when you show it, it wouldn't show potentially sensitive data that you wouldn't want, say, accidentally showing up in a log. Uh, and it also removes its data from memory when it goes out of scope. So these are basically optimizations to make sure that several common attacks don't happen on it. So that's the memory package. Uh, that's byte array and byte array access. Now I'm going to move on to the second sort of fundamental, I think, of the Kryptonite library. Again, going back to our argon2 type signature. So if you look at the very bottom of the type signature, you can see that it's not just returning a byte array. It's returning a crypto failable uh, byte array. So crypto failable. Uh, is our next fundamental, and it's literally just a specialized either, uh, like totally isomorphic or whatever you want to call it to either. You can see that its constructors are crypto passed A, which is just like right, and crypto failed crypto error, which is just like left except specialized to this crypto error. So to give a little bit more detail about it, uh, crypto failable is from the module crypto.error in Kryptonite. It's an instance of monad, so that means that you can, for example, use do notation and do several cryptographic computations that might fail in order, and it'll short circuit on the first one that fails. It can be pretty useful. Uh, the module includes utility functions to convert that to maybe either throw an exception with it. Uh, and finally, it's worth noting that crypto error, which was uh, what we had on our left case, basically, is effectively just an enum of about 20 different types of error you can have when doing cryptography. So you know, there's one for your key is too short or the length of your C that you used for your uh, hashing function wasn't the correct length. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ones you can get from there. Now I'm gonna move on to uh, bcrypt. So uh, again, we have the byte arrays used at the top for the password and the hash but you'll now also see a type class constraint for monad random. So monad random is super simple. All it is is this one function, get random bytes, which you pass it an integer, the number of bytes you want, and you get back a byte array, be it you know, a string or a byte string, a byte scrub bytes, or a new type of any of those uh, that is the appropriate length. The main instance of this is just IO, so it, you know, very easy to use from your main function or where, whatever. Um, but obviously the fact that it's this own separate monad can be nice because you can have a type signature for, for example, bcrypt from before, and you know that it can't do arbitrary IO. The only side effect it can have is generating random numbers, uh, which makes it a little nicer uh, to use and that you know what it can't do. Seems a little safer for cryptography to not be able to do arbitrary things, just do this one thing. Uh, finally, I'll note that you're frequently going to need type annotations for this function. 
Uh, so, you know, you say, when I, I get random bytes, I specifically want a byte string. The reason is because you frequently use this function and then right after it, you use another function that takes a byte array and you're gonna need to tell the compiler, uh, this is what I meant to generate, byte string instead of string. Yes, go ahead. Uh, are there any other common implementations of Murdoch random that uh, It's possible. I mean, there's definitely a lot of like random number generation out there. I would use this one because I trust the authors of Kryptonite to like know example, that it's secure. Yes, so uh, the library also has those and it provides, that's the only other instance besides IO that it provides for it and it allows you to get like a deterministic random number generator uh, or to pass a seed and that might be useful if you, for example, you had a test and you wanted to have consistent output from that hashing function always using the same random numbers. So yes, it does provide that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that kind of covers the three fundamentals I wanted to talk about for kryptonite. Uh, I think they're all pretty simple and now that you're familiar with them, you'll be able to look at pretty much all the functions in kryptonite and know how to use them pretty much immediately. So the first example of actually using the stuff I want to talk about is bcrypt. So bcrypt, as you probably know, is a password hashing function. Like all password hashing functions, it's specialized for short keys. So the reason you need to use something like bcrypt or scrypt or argon2 is because users' passwords are quite short, unlike, say, a 512-bit key that's totally random. That's why we need these specialized functions. Uh, and you'd use this if you say have a web application, you need to hash a user's password so that your application can't read it. But when a user goes to log in again, uh, you can hash their data and compare it against what you have in the database. So very commonly used everywhere, very important cryptographic function. So the way you do it uh, with Kryptonite is you just go to the crypto.kdf, which stands for key derivation function, uh, .bcrypt module. And there's only two functions you need to use out of there. The first is hash password, which actually hashes the password for you and uh, generates your hash data. And the second is validate password either, which takes the input that your user entered the next time they log in and compares it against the hash you stored. Uh, so now I'm gonna do a demo. As soon as I can get out of full screen. Okay, uh, so the first thing I wanna look at is this new type we have here called hash password. So again, a cool thing about Kryptonite using say byte array and byte array access as opposed to just a byte string is that we can create our own new types that uh, derive byte array and byte array access and then just pass those into the library and get them out of the library. The advantage of that is now once I have a new type for hash passwords and password resets codes and all the other binary data I have, I can't mix them up. So of course, like just the usual advantages of new types. Uh, next, uh, we have our bcrypt cost here, which I'm defining as 12. Uh, so bcrypt has just a single configuration, the cost, and basically every time you increment this integer, it roughly doubles the amount of time it takes to run the function. So the idea is that over time, as computers get stronger, you need to occasionally increment this number and uh, that way uh, faster computers can't solve your hash passwords very quickly. So next we have the actual meat of it, the hash password function. So again, it has this monad random constraint that you saw before. And we just call, call bcrypt.hash password with our cost and a text which I convert into a byte string. The reason I'm converting it is because the text that the user passed in from say a web form is not an instance of uh, byte array. So I do that and I get out a hash password. Uh, because that's an instance of byte array. It can create it right there without me even having to wrap it in the new type. Uh, I have a new type here for an exception. Um, basically, I'm just gonna use this in a second because I wanna be able to throw if we have corrupted hash data. Uh, so here we have our check correct password function. And you can see that it takes the text, which is just a plain text password the user passes in, uh, the hashed password that you got by, by pulling it out of your database, uh, and it returns uh, a Boolean whether or not the password is correct. So very simple. Uh, it calls validate password either, passes in the user's password that they put in and the stored hash. Uh, in the right case, that's saying that the cryptography succeeded. 
and then we're returning a Boolean whether or not the user's password is correct. In the left case, we have a cryptography error. In that case, we throw an exception. Uh, now, it's notable here that it's not using crypto failable. Uh, I'm pretty sure just the reason for this is that uh, the bcrypt module is older and existed before crypto failable came out. And newer code like argon2 is using crypto failable. So you might notice a disconnect with older parts of the library that they've probably kept to not break backwards compatibility. Uh, so I'm just going to do a real quick demo of it. I'll start up DHCI. OK, so first I'll call my hash password function. Uh, you might have noticed the pause there uh, when I call hash password. Uh, that's because with a cost of 12, it does take my computer uh, not instantaneously to get the answer out. Um, so you'll see if you look at the output that hash password gave us that at the beginning there's these dollar signs and those are just separators for some metadata that is included in the hash. So the 2A is the uh, version of bcrypt being used, 12 is the cost, and then this remaining data is the random seed that was generated to do the hash and the actual hash data. So basically what this does is instead of bcrypt returning a bunch of data, it just returns everything in a byte string, and you can store that in your database without really worrying about what's inside. And then later, you just need to pull that out, uh, or sorry, you don't need to pull it out. The library can pull it out for you, parse that data out, and uh, check that the hash is valid. This is pretty standard across pretty much all cryptography libraries. Uh, so yeah, you can also see that uh, when I ran it a second time, or the first time I got this, number that starts with uh, WJA, and this time I got one that starts with J1Z. That's because obviously each time you run it, it's generating a new random seed uh, to give you new data each time. So uh, that makes it more secure against attackers that each one is randomized. Uh, so now let's check that the password is correct. So I'll call check correct password with uh, something that's correct and what we had hashed, and I get back true. If I change the data, I get that false. So exactly what you'd expect from password hashing. Super simple, uh, but a nice thing to do with uh, Kryptonite. Yes? Uh, so I'm not an expert on Bcrypt at home. Um, is that Bcrypt function, is that actually generating a salt then and actually by itself including that salt in the byte string? Is that what you're describing? Yes, uh, it is doing that. Um, if you look at the various key derivation functions that Kryptonite has for uh, storing passwords, some of them, like say scrypt, have only like one function, like just hash scrypt, and that's not very convenient. You need to do like the random C generation and stuff yourself, I believe. But the bcrypt module, as well as maybe the argon2 module, I'm not positive, provides these convenience functions for to use that do it all for you. Uh, in general, I'd probably recommend just let the library do it all for you. That way you're using the same implementation as everyone else. There's no chance you're screwing things up. Uh, that definitely seems like the way to go. Um, but if you do want to use something like Scrypt, you have to do work on your own, or maybe, maybe you want to customize things for some reason, maybe you need to reach down a little bit lower. So yeah, thank you for noting that. Okay, um, on to our second example of using Kryptonite. Uh, I think this one's a lot cooler because you know, I'd kind of expect Haskell to have stuff like decrypt, like that seems pretty standard. I bet you could just link a C library and write bindings for it. Uh, but TOTP is a little less common. Uh, TOTP is a, stands for time-based one-time password. Uh, basically the way it works is the server generates a secret key, then they share that secret key with the client. And then to authenticate, both the server and the client run the TOTP algorithm using the current time as an input, and then they compare that one-time password they generate, and if that value matches what both the server and the client have, then that means it was a successful authentication. So the most famous implementation of TOTP is probably Google Authenticator, probably followed by the company Authy, if you've heard of them. Uh, and basically what Google Authenticator did is they took the standard RFC for implementing TOTP 
and they made a few refinements to it in limitations. So you need to base 32 encode the secret key. Uh, that makes it uh, case insensitive and uh, reduces it to just numbers and letters that someone can easily type and also removes padding from it. So when you base 32 encode something, you might end up with equal signs on the end. You just remove those uh, to encode it to be nicer for the user and enter. Uh, it adds some restrictions, like it only works in 30 second intervals. Uh, that means that there's less of a chance for a mismatch between the client and server. And the way it usually works is the Google Authenticator app reads the key as a QR code. Uh, so again, it's gonna be super simple to implement using Kryptonite. Uh, you just go to the crypto.otp module and use the crypto verify function uh, with the default TOTP params. So the verify function uh, actually checks based on the time you pass in and the OTP uh, and the seed you've stored that it's correct. And default TOTP params uh, is parameters you can use to customize how it's checked. So the biggest thing you might want to check is the window for how big of um, time you want to look at. So you can imagine that since the password that's being created is based on the current time, that the time on a user's cell phone might not match the time on the server. So what you can do is specify a window of I'll take plus or minus 30 seconds or plus or minus a minute and check all of those times to see if they match what the user had. That way the user is less likely to have random errors and this makes it uh, obviously a better user experience. So now I'm going to talk about the procedure for how you'd implement this in, say, like a real web application. Like you want to go off to server or your SOD and whatever and do all the work. And we're going to do a simplified version of this in our little demo. So the procedure would be you generate a secret key and you store it in the database and you mark that secret key as being unverified, as in the user has not correctly entered something for that code yet. Then you return the secret key to the client uh, in that you know, base 32 encoded format that Google Authenticator can read. And your client should render a QR code with uh, this format, OTP off colon forward slash last TOTP slash say the name of your company, question mark secret equals your secret and the issuer equals again, like the name of your company or your organization or whatever. So that would usually be a QR code that the camera can scan. Next, the user would scan the QR code using Google Authenticator and they'd get a six digit code on their phone, which I'll show in a second. Then you just use the TOTP verify with default TOTP params to validate the code and mark the code as verified. Uh, you mark it as verified, that way you know that in the future when a user logs in, you should require this uh, OTP code from them as well as their password, and this gives you two-factor authentication. So this is great because it's much more secure than just using a password, uh, and it's also much more secure than just using, say, an SMS message. There have been many recent attacks where someone has either intercepted SMS messages or they just walk up to like a random employee in a Verizon or T-Mobile store and ask them to change this phone number over to their account. Uh, this attack's like so easy that one of my former coworkers just called up T-Mobile and asked them to transfer someone's phone number to her and they just did it. Like, there are many random people are able to do this. So this is a much more secure alternative. Uh, so now I'm going to get into a demo of how we can implement this using Kryptonite. Okay, again at the top here, we're going to follow the same pattern of creating a couple new types for uh, what we're going to use. So we know we're going to have a TOTP secret key. That's the key that we're going to store in the database and use later. And uh, that's going to be a new type over byte string. And we'll just take byte strings byte array access from it using generalized new type deriving, pretty standard. Uh, we're also going to have a new type for a Google Authenticator encoded key, and that's the base32 encoded key that's specially formatted for Google Authenticator. Uh, then uh, I'm going to look at our random TOTP secret key function. So again, you can see this is operating in just monad random. All it needs to do is generate random numbers, and it will return that secret key in the two forms we have it, you know, the regular binary form and the Google Authenticator encoded form. Uh, as far as uh, how big this key should be. Google Authenticator accepts arbitrary length secrets. Uh, it uses 80 bits for its own services, but the RFC 4226 recommends 160 bits or 20 byte secret keys. So I'm sure either of those are fine. Uh, but we use the 20 byte one recommended in the RFC, but pretty sure you can use whatever you want. Uh, as far as doing the 
Google Authenticator authentication. It's pretty simple. We have this uh, Google Authenticator encode function down here. And the first thing it does is convert to base32 from the byte string uh, that it's given. Then we convert that byte string into text. Uh, then we strip padding from it, which is just dropping the equal signs at the ends and wrap it in our new type. So basically your web server, again, be it Yasod or Scotty or whatever, would call this random TOTP secret key function. It would do the work of storing the secret key in the database and then sending the Google Authenticator encoded key back to the client uh, to be probably formatted as a QR code. So then you know, the user would go off and scan the QR code and that would give them the OTP, the six digit code, and you would call verify TOTP password on your server on the next web request. What you would do is you get the current time. I'm using uh, the data dot, uh, the, like the, just the time library, the standard time library to get a time library to get the POSIX time uh, and convert it to just the OTP time that the library uses. You're able to use like your own time library if you want. I guess there's some other time libraries, time libraries out there like Hourglass if you want to use them. Uh, and then just call TOTP verify with the parameters and the key that you stored before, the current time and the code that the user passed in. So does that make sense everyone? Uh, I'm gonna do a real simple demo of it. So I'm gonna load up in GHCI our TOTP uh, code. And let's see here, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna generate a random TOTP secret key. So from that I get a secret and I also get the Google Authenticator encoded version. So that's what our secret looks like, and that's what encoded looks like. So again, that's the same data, just one is encoded a little differently. Uh, and if this was a real website, then I'd have you know a nice um, web service doing this for us, but we can just make it a little easier to try it out. We can uh, create the URL ourselves using this encoded data we got. So again, this is the format that Google Authenticator expects. And I'm just going to go to this QR code generator.com website. I'll paste in my, my code. All right, now I, or anyone really, could use the Google Authenticator app. And I can just go and scan this barcode. Uh, and at the bottom that you can see it, I get like a code on my phone that I can then use to go check it against what GHCI gives me. So now let's go back and call verify TOTP password. And that takes the secret key I had before, the secret. Uh, and it takes the OTP and that's the six digit code it's giving me. So the code is 086336. You know, let's see what we get. We get true. So it's saying that it was successful. It matched uh, correctly. And if I change the code a little bit, like I enter a zero instead of a six at the end, I get false. So there you have two factor authentication, super simple, two functions. Go ahead. Yeah, so that's like computing, uh, computing over Time that you give it, having, having a range of times so of plus and minus 30 seconds and then doing values for each of those, or? Uh, not quite. I was, I guess, a little unclear when I said it before. So uh, in the Google Authenticator encoded version, the sorry, in the Google Authenticator implementation, the way it works is it floors it to 60 seconds. So you'll get um, you know, zero and 30 seconds and the next minute. And I believe by default with Kryptonite, it also goes out um, an additional 30 seconds on either end of that. Uh, so you'll get, I guess, five potential values that it's gonna check against. Okay, so that's uh, been TOTP. Um, uh, one thing I wanna mention is that you saw in that code before that I needed to convert um, the byte string we generated into base32. So data.memory.encoding from the memory package actually provides a pretty convenient utility for this, convert to base, 
and it takes in a byte array access. It returns a byte array, just as you'd expect. You read from the byte array access, you write out a byte array, uh, you pass it a base, like base 32, 16, 64, um, and you get the data out. The reason I think this is worth mentioning is because you need to do often a lot of uh, base 64 or 32 or 16 conversion for cryptography, because you have some sort of binary data and you want to display it to a user in some way or store it in a database in some textual form. And you know, before I would probably just Google base 64 and hackage and got base 64 byte string or base 32 byte string or base 32 string. But again, following the same pattern of let's standardize on kryptonite and have one thing that works, uh, you could replace all of those different packages with memory and get advantages like the fact that base32 byte string hasn't been updated in five years, or base32 string performs incorrect conversion in some cases, so failing at the only thing it's intended to do. Uh, so I just think that's worth noting that if you need to do these conversions, just use the memory package you already have rather than reaching for new libraries. Uh, I have my next example, which is AEAD, or actually I'm not quite ready for demo. Uh, AEAD stands for Authenticated Encryption with Associated Data. And authenticated basically means that it can check that the data hasn't been forged. So if you were to just use a cipher like AES uh, using it in CTR mode, then you can't actually tell when you run it on a piece of data if what you're getting out is uh, you know, garbage or if it was what you originally had in there. You also importantly can't check that someone hasn't intentionally passed you bad data. And the reason that's important is uh, historically there have been a number of tax attacks where if you don't check that someone hasn't tampered with the data, then people can start to gather information about the underlying secret key that's being used to encrypt your data and over time can figure out what your actual secret key is breaking the encryption. So uh, there are many ways to defeat this. Uh, a very common one is you use some sort of MAC function, a message authentication function in combination with an encryption function. And libraries like say client session, which Desoad and maybe Servant, I'm not sure, use, uh, they use that approach. So the advantage of AEAD is it basically bundles all that together and provides you, uh, you know, one bundle of code that does it for you. And the reason that's important is because if you try and say mix and match max with your own encryption, you might say screw up the order and that could make it significantly cryptographically weaker, uh, which is very bad. So now let's go more into AEAD. Um, we should note that it supports encryption and or authentication. So it has two parts. Uh, there's a plain text header part and this part is uh, always in plain text. You're just doing the authentication on it. So all it's giving you is the ability to check if it's been altered or not. Uh, and it also has a part that's actually encrypted. Uh, and you can use either one of those or both. An example where you need both is if you say are encrypting network packets, they have a header, which is in plain text, but you still want to check hasn't accidentally been changed or been changed by someone maliciously and a body, which is actually encrypted. So, you can get those two things together using AEAD, which is a nice feature of it. Uh, and now let's do a demo. This one is gonna be a little more involved than the uh, previous ones. So I'm just gonna kind of go through it uh, piece by piece. And I guess I'll note that because it's Haskell, you can really just work back from what you wanna do. You can look at the AEAD functions and look at their type signatures and mostly just not screw up the whole way, which is nice. So again, let's start with our new types. We have a new type for an AES-256 key. This is the underlying cipher that AEAD is going to use. Uh, the way that they're set up is that there are several different types of AEAD methods, and they can use varying uh, underlying ciphers. We're using AES-256. I have a new type for the plain text header, uh, and that's the authenticated thing that is stored in plain text. Uh, a new type for encrypted data representing data that's been encrypted. Uh, and then finally, I have this IV or initial vector. Uh, this is just another name for the random seed you generate uh, when you're doing cryptographic operations. Uh, I also have a record for what we get out of our encryption function. So I'm just gonna store all that together because it all really represents one unit of information. 
and uh, that way I can, you know, serialize it into a database. I can change one thing from it and see how changing just the one thing uh, changes uh, how uh, the various functions work on it. All right, so with uh, the plumbing out of the way, let's get into the actual code. First, we're just going to create a key. So very similar as before when we created a random key, we just do get random bytes 32. It gives us back this AES256 key because that was an instance of byte array. Uh, 32 bytes as in 32 times 8 equals 256 bits is how you get that number. Uh, then I have an encrypt byte string function. So that operates within monad random. Again, takes a key and a plain text header you want to uh, authenticate and a byte string that you actually want to encrypt uh, and then it returns a crypto failable so saying something could fail and doing this cryptography uh, with an encrypted data package that has all that information that you would want to store all right so getting into the first line we're really just gonna follow a chain of things that could potentially fail uh, first we'll start by creating our block cipher uh, AES 256 so you call cipher init with the key and uh, say that that's going to give us an AES-256 out. Cypher init is a generic function that can be used within Kryptonite to generate multiple times of block cipher. So that's why we give it this type signature for AES-256. If the crypto passed, uh, and it might fail if we gave it, say, an invalid key, then we get a cipher out of it. And when we get a cipher, uh, next, let's check the block size of that cipher and get that amount of random bytes and create an initialization vector for it. Again, uh, this is the random seed. Then we need an AEAD context. Uh, so to get that, we do AEAD init. We pass in a mode. So the mode we're using is OCB. Uh, there's a variety of different modes you can use. I think maybe like four or five are in the Kryptonite library. Uh, an important thing to check is that some of these are secured by patents. So AEAD OCB is uh, known for being pretty fast, but uh, you can't use it for like any military or a lot of government purposes. So if you were maybe like a military contractor, even if you just made something for the Department of Energy, you're completely banned from using this. So it's worth checking up on that kind of thing. Uh, not super well documented. Uh, again, so going back to AEAD init, uh, we create it with the mode, the cipher we created before, and the initial seed. Uh, and again, that could fail because maybe you had an invalid initialization vector, or maybe the cipher that you passed in wasn't supported by the AEAD mode you're using. Sorry, go ahead. That mode specifies a whole package of like, configurations for the pieces that make up AEAD, like putting, using CTR mode versus CDC versus different types of hash. Uh, yes, I'm pretty sure that they have like various different schemes and that like that one thing specifies the entire scheme of how it's going to work. That's all the configuration there is. Uh, I am not familiar enough with cryptography to be able to tell you how the different schemes work or what different things they can do, but that's the only piece of data you need to pass in to get something out. And the cipher. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. And cipher and the IV. Uh, okay, so let's assume that uh, that works. We get a crypto passed out of the, oh, I'm a little worried because my laptop is freezing up. We'll see how this goes. Uh, crypto pass will give us an AEAD context out, and then we can call AEAD simple encrypt, which takes the context, that plain text header, and the secret data, and uh, the tag length. Um, we're using 16 byte tag length for uh, 128 bits. And then we get out an authentication tag, which is the thing that we can use later to check the data hasn't been changed and our encrypted data. Uh, and then we return that in this uh, crypto passed encrypted data package uh, wrapper, basically. So that's how we're going to encrypt the data. I understand there's quite a bit there, but if you just were to look at the documentation and see AEAD simple encrypt, you can really just trace things backwards and it, get all of that stuff out there pretty simply. Uh, as far as decrypting it, uh, again, we create our cipher, uh, our AES-256 uh, cipher, and we again create our context using the data that we stored in the package before. Uh, and then we just call simple decrypt and we get a crypto failable, maybe by string out of it. So I'm going to now just demonstrate how this works on Hackage. It should be pretty simple. 
Uh, let's see here. I'm going to load AAD. So first I'm going to create a key. And that key looks like this. Uh, then I'm going to encrypt a byte string. So I've encrypted secret data as my byte string, and my plain text header is metadata, reflecting how you might use it. And this is what it looks like in the actual record. So now let's see if uh, we can decrypt it. Actually, first let me unwrap it from that crypto pass. I'm just going to do like an unsafe pattern match for convenience. All right, now we can call decrypt package and pass it our key. And let's see, and the package. All right, so when we pass in all the data correctly, we get crypto passed out of it. Uh, that's the first kind of wrapper, which means that the cryptography is itself succeeded, uh, which means you didn't pass in an invalid key length or anything like that, or an invalid initialization vector. And then the second piece of data that the function returns is a maybe for whether or not uh, the actual data correct, uh, encrypted correctly. So like there was a correct key and correct data coming out of it. So in this case, we get just secret data. Uh, and you can see that if we were to change something, say we change the header of our package, then we get crypto pass nothing. Uh, and I'm stalling because I have a beach ball on my MacBook right now. So here I'm going to just change the header. So I've changed the metadata and it will give me nothing back. So it's checking that this plain text thing was never changed, just like you'd want it to if you were, say, encrypting cookies. Uh, I can also do the same thing with the data. I can change the data when decrypting. And again, I get nothing. Uh, whereas if I decrypt it with a bad key, um, this is clearly a bad AES-256 key then I get crypto failed. So it gives me one of those enum values from before that says there was a crypto error, your key size is invalid. Uh, all right, uh, I think that's all the time I have. So uh, I am open to questions. Or if we, maybe we don't have time for even questions. Well, we can do a couple of questions. Uh, before, does anyone have a question for Matt? Sure, go ahead. Uh, like how did it come about? So. My, so it's uh, authored by Vincent Hasquez, and my understanding is that he had done many different packages before, like he had written OTP, he had worked on other ones, and kind of decided on this as a way to standardize it. I believe that it started out as a library of like primitives, and it's kind of grown to be more user-friendly over time is my read of it. Uh, honestly, like, you know, I don't know the details of this, but just speculating, I have seen him comment in other libraries for example, client session and say like, hey, I think you guys should actually change to using AEAD instead of doing your own Mac and uh, encryption with AES. And uh, people didn't want to do that. So I imagine that might have inspired Kryptonite to have a one-stop shop that everyone can standardize on. But again, speculation. Go ahead. How much of the implementation is Haskell versus Lexi? So that's a good question, and it totally varies by what you want to do. Pretty sure that Bcrypt, for example, is 100% Haskell, whereas I believe the more recent Argon2, which came out in like 2015, is just a wrapper to the C library. I imagine there's trade-offs in which one you'd prefer. Like maybe you think a pure Haskell version is uh, less likely to have some of the memory areas you'd have in C, but on the other hand, the C libraries are you know, way more standardized. Everybody's using the same C library for Argon2, which seems like a big advantage. But then maybe if there's a vulnerability than that, that everybody's going to attack that, whereas nobody's looking at the Haskell version. Uh, so yeah, I'd say, I mean, you know, maybe the attackers are We are looking at the Haskell version. Uh, so I, you'd say you'd have to look on a case-by-case -case basis, unfortunately. Yeah. No questions? Sure. Um, I think so, but I'm not sure. 
I'm actually pretty certain actually that some individual parts of it do. Like my understanding is that Argon 2 has several different modes that you can run it in. And one of those modes is specialized to prevent side channel attacks. Like if someone else was on shared hosting, run this version because they wouldn't be able to get as much data from it. In that case, I think it performs more similarly to S-Script, whereas they have a version that I think is faster and is not resistant to side channel attacks and a version that's a combination. So I'm not sure if the package does like anything specific to help against it, but I know that individual pieces of it like Argon2 are able to do that. All right, great, thanks very much, Max. Okay.